A very warm welcome to our service this morning. This is our pre-recorded service for Sunday the 22nd of September. And today we're looking at a reading from Titus chapter 2, verses 1 to 15, which is the whole of it. And today I want us to think about what is my role in the church, because that's what Paul is addressing in his letter to Titus. So our call to worship this morning. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. And that's taken from 1 John chapter 3, verses 18. And our prayer of adoration this morning. Gracious God, we come rejoicing in your presence and proclaiming the glory of your kingdom. For your mercy reaches from the heavens to the very depths, and your kindness and grace are seen in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now receive our worship, all we have and all we are, for your glory's sake. Amen. Come now to our confession. Let us come before the Lord with humble hearts and confess our sins as we say together. Merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May God, our Father, forgive us our sins and bring us to the fellowship of his table with his saints forever. Amen. Just a reminder in the notices that our usual uh, events are, are now back on as the schools have gone back. So Hope Cafe is meeting on Tuesday. Uh, the Tots are meeting on Thursday. And the Food Bank will meet on Friday. Also on Saturday, the ladies will be decorating the church for our Harvest Festival. So I think those are the key events. Um, but just a, a thank you for those who turned up for the maintenance day yesterday. Thank you very much for your time, your efforts in helping us maintain and keep this building clean and ready for use. At this point in the service, we will normally be coming to our offertory. And for those of you who have given online, thank you very much. And shall we just come before the Lord and give thanks? Loving God, in your generosity, you have given us life through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now bless these gifts and our lives for your kingdom's sake. Amen. As I said, our reading is taken from Titus chapter 2 starting at verse 1 and reading through to the end of verse 15. And it's often entitled, Doing Good for the Sake of the Gospel. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled and sound in faith, in love and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent, in the way they live, not to be slanderous or addicted to too much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of the Lord. Similarly, Encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. 
in your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be the subject of their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodly and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us from all wickedness, and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach, encourage and rebuke, rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, I've entitled my um, thoughts this morning, my reflection this morning, on what is my role. And whilst I just change screen slightly here, let me just bring those thoughts to mind. And there's really sort of three sections to my reflection this morning. But... I want to ask you a question right up front. And it's one I want you to have in your mind as we look at this reading from Titus, thinking about it only in terms of our reading. But also think of it in terms of your daily day, day to day living. And the question is simply this. What is my role? Particularly, what is my role in church? Titus 2 sets out a roadmap for Christian living that goes beyond age, gender, and social status. So it has something for all of us, whatever our gender, and regardless of our age and social standing. Paul reminds us that we need to be rooted in sound doctrine. He calls for a life characterized by godliness, patience, love, and, re and reflective of the redeeming and transformative power of Christ. As we expect Christ's return, Paul reminds Titus that our daily conduct is a powerful testimony of God's grace and redemption through our lives. So the first part I want to look at is... is really looking at sound doctrine and Christian conduct. And this is what you'll find in verses 1 to 10. And Paul here is urging Titus to teach sound doctrine that corresponds with good works. Now, some of Paul's instruction is for Titus as a young leader of the Christian church in Crete. And some of it is for members of the Cretan church itself. To begin with, I take it that Paul is speaking directly to Titus. His youthful ways may have been why Paul was writing to Titus. Perhaps his youthful, youthful enthusiasm had ruffled feathers. Had he upset some of those more established in the church? Had he favoured the young more than the elderly? Had he forgotten the Proverbs? In Proverbs 16, verse 31, we read, Grey hair is a crown of glory. It is gained in a righteous life. Or Proverbs 20, verse 29, The glory of young men is their strength, but the splendor of old men is their grey hair. We may never know. However, I think it does illustrate an issue that exists to this very day. 
And that is, how can we treat everybody evenly and fairly and avoid favouring one group over another? To avoid favouring our friends over others. Those of us who are fortunate to be parents to more than one child knows how difficult it is in treating our children equitably. But I see in this instruction that it can also be applied to Christian leaders more generally. And I suppose in many respects I am a Christian leader in that I speak up at the front of the church I occasionally officiate at meetings, prayer meetings, reading the Bible and even preaching. I have led Bible study groups. The standard that applies to leaders must be high and Christian leaders are to be held to the highest standards in terms of a model of good works and sound speech that cannot be condemned. I fear I often fall short. The question for myself is how can I model the gospel of Jesus and godly living better? How can I encourage and build rather than hurting and destroying with my words? And these are the same questions that Paul is posing to Titus. Now it's probably when I'm under stress that I find myself the poorest reflection of this godly life. Usually the stress comes when there's something that's time critical or something with a, a, a hard deadline that has to be met. Although thankfully, since I've retired, uh, that happens a lot less. But I do feel for Titus. When I was working, I was responsible for publishing guidance and qualifications that many thousands of people around the world were using or were reliant on for their businesses. That brought a certain amount of stress. Would we have the guidance ready in time? Would it be sound enough? Was it clear enough? And perhaps the most stressful was would I pass the exam in the qualification and guidance that I had commissioned? So I can really feel for Titus and the pressure he was under. But perhaps my background was good training for standing up here. Training and teaching are necessary. After all, the shepherd doesn't let the flock just go off and find its own food and water. Rather, they move them to good pasture and water. Paul charged Titus to teach sound doctrine. Paul devotes much energy in his letters to exposing and refuting false teachings, i.e. an unsound doctrine. The question for us is how do we recognise sound and unsound doctrine? As church wardens, Alistair and I have a duty to ensure the vicar doesn't preach heresy. And we all have a role to play there. But what is our yardstick? Well, how about these for starters? In two words, feedback and discussion. Feedback, discussion. Tell me if something if I say something that's wrong, and let's discuss it and let's revolve, resolve it and talk it through. And we can also ask ourselves, is this just my opinion or is it a biblical truth? Of course, our opinions are not always sound, are they? Is it adding or taking away from scripture? In other words, let the plain words of scripture be your guide. Does the teaching agree with major Christian creeds? The creeds, after all, list the fundamental, uh, uh, fundamental doctrines of the faith. Is this teaching something new to the church that's never been taught before? While it is possible that I may have come up with a new angle on some passage that no one has ever preached on, or written about before. It's probably also very unlikely. Solomon said that there is nothing new under the sun. Most new teachings are likely to be spurious. 
Am I submitting myself and my teaching to the oversight of a godly group of biblically appointed elders? God established the office of eldership for a reason. And Mark has been Mark talked about it last week when we looked at Titus 1. The plurality of elders provides safety in that they can keep each other and the church accountable. Where one person may stray from a sound doctrine due to emotion being deceived or some other reason, it is less likely that a group of mature elders will all fall for that same false teaching. Now, the good news is that Paul's advice to Titus has something for all of us, doesn't it? Paul often talks about one body, many parts. And the most obvious place is to have a look in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 27. But here in Titus, he provides specific instructions for, well, frankly, virtually every one of us. So let's have a look at that guidance in more detail. Paul says to the older men, while their physical strength might be less than before, their experiences make up for it. These experiences, combined with many years of service and Bible study, gives them a wisdom that a younger man may lack. Older women, to be respectful, to avoid gossip or drinking too much, so that you can teach what is good to others. Offer mentorship to those who are younger or less experienced than yourselves. The church is healthy when we are both learning from and sharing with others. Paul has guidance for young women. Be kind, love your husbands and children, especially in reflecting Christ's self-giving love of others. Learn from those with more experience and let Titus be your example. Young men. Paul encourages Titus to encourage the young men in the same way, to be an example. And in every situation, they should learn to control themselves. Slaves. Be loyal workers, a bonus to their masters. No back talk, no petty thievery. Then the good character will shine through their actions. Adding luster to the teaching of our Saviour. The overall emphasis here seems to be on self-control, godliness, self-giving love and patience. Just before I move on, let me say, of course, age is not just a number. Looking around, I am older than many of you, but I am younger than some of you. So it's a relative thing and not strictly a chronological thing. It could, of course, also relate to the number of years I've been an active Christian and not simply my chronological age. I might be old in age, but I could be young in Christ. Or I could be younger in age, but more mature in Christ. The second thought runs through the power of Christ's redemption. And here, focusing in on verses 11 and 12, really. Paul transitions into speaking about the grace of God that brings salvation for all people, urging believers to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Note, though, that it says salvation is for all people, not to just a few. He speaks of Christ's sacrifice, saying that he gave himself to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. Grace brings salvation. And you don't go out and get salvation. It comes to you and you can receive it. 
Grace arrives, though, with its own instructions. And that's simply run away from anything that leads us away from God. Abandon the lusts and passions of this world. The live life now in this age. From awareness to one of self-control. Doing the right thing and keeping yourselves holy. Grace, after all, is the gateway to eternal life. This, of course, is dealing with the first epiphany or the first revelation of Christ when he first appeared. But Paul is now going to go on and look further ahead to Christ's return. And that's the third and final part that I want to look at. And that's in verses 13 and 15. And here we read of the anticipation of Christ's return. Some translations, instead of wait, use looking for or watch for. And I prefer the more active translations. The voice puts it this way. Watch for his return. Expect the blessed hope we all share when our great God and Saviour, Jesus the Anointed One, appears again. I see it as meaning that the Christians should live in an active expectation of the return of Christ. It should be precious for Christians to consider the second epiphany or the revelation of Christ. Contrast, if you will, the differences between the first and the looked-for return of Christ in terms of his role. When Christ first came, it was to redeem the soul of man. But when he comes again, it will be to resurrect our bodies. When Christ first came, it was to save the individual. But when he comes again, he will save humanity. When Christ first came, it was for a crucifixion. It was for a sacrifice to die on the cross. But when he comes again, it will be for a coronation when he is crowned king. When Christ first came, men judged him. But when he comes again, he will judge all men. And in this final verse, Paul encourages Titus to declare these truths with all authority instructing and rebuking with all command, and to let no one disregard him. It takes courage to step out and share God's word with others. And at the same time, we need to remember, though, who, who has commissioned us to do just that, and to rely on his strength and guidance through the Holy Spirit to carry out our allotted task. Chapter 2 is an essential part of Paul's pastoral letter to Titus, a young church leader in Crete, to encourage him and guide him. While it's mainly a personal letter to Titus, it is likely to have been read throughout the Cretan church as a whole, and is therefore also a public endorsement of Titus in that leadership and eldership role. In this chapter, Paul lays out practical guidelines for Christian living, emphasising the importance of sound doctrine in influencing behaviour, the responsibilities of various groups within the Christian community, and the transformative power of Christ's redemption. Why is this important? Then, and perhaps even more so now, the church is judged by what people outside see. Now, they say you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but if all you can see is its cover, then you're going to use that to judge its contents. Likewise, it is the behaviours expressed by church members that others see that they will use to judge whether the church is adhering to its principles in the way it deals with fellow church members. In other words, people will decide 
if church is a good place to be or not based on how people are treated. Division can be very destructive and Paul is arguing against this divisiveness and for leading a godly life so that outsiders do not look down upon the church. And we all have a role to play in the life of the church. Paul says we are all different, but we are all members of the one body. We all have different roles to play in the life of the church. So I'll return to my original question. What is my role in church? I pray that our thinking of, about our reading from Titus this morning might stimulate you to explore that further and to think about how our behaviour reflects on how people might see and judge the church. So what does it take to develop this godly lifestyle? Well, I think Paul lays down some pretty good examples for church life in Titus, about each of us having a role. On the individual side, we need to ask ourselves, what are we spending our time reading? Is it God's word or is it our Facebook feeds? Do we spend time talking to God in prayer? Do we spend time with other Christians in fellowship? Do we spend time talking to others about our faith? Where is our head? Where, where is our head at? What do our actions reveal about us? What do our words reveal about us? Now, these are questions that perhaps only you can answer for yourselves. However, all I would say is that they are good ways to recharge our spiritual and emotional batteries. So if you feel your faith draining away, these are perhaps things you ought to be doing more of. Developing a godly mindset and a lifestyle takes effort, but it is worth it. If you haven't been doing so, so far, give it a try. Spend time with God in prayer. Spend time with God reading the Bible, either alone or in small groups, so that you can know God's will for you and what he wants you to do, but then carry out that task. Put yourself in the Holy Spirit's hands. Be kind to yourself and know that you will mess up. Hey, we all do. But the reality, because that is the reality of life. But take each mistake to God and repent. Learn from it for next time and take heart. Every effort you make is pleasing to God. It will be noticed. It will be blessed. Amen. And our prayer after the reflection. Lord, may we always be alert and follow your teaching and guidance for our lives, that we may grow and develop and become closer to God. May we listen to his voice and calling on our lives, whatever our roles are in church, whatever our roles in our daily life that we may carry them out to the glory of God. Forgive us when our behaviour does not reflect your glory or teaching. Strengthen us so that next time we are tempted to stray, we will remain on the path that you have laid out for us. Amen. We just continue in a short time of prayer. Lord, we pray for your creation and the world that you have made. We pray for the things that we do to it. Lord, we'd lift before you the conflict 
in Israel, Gaza, the Lebanon, where it seems to be spinning out of hand. People talk about trying to free the hostages, and yet there seems to be an ongoing escalation of violence. Lord, we lift before you also the Ukraine, fighting to protect itself from the aggression and invasion of the Russian forces. Lord, may they be able to rebuff the advancing Russian troops. May they receive the support that they need to be able to maintain their freedom. But Lord, wherever there is conflict in the world, we lay it before you. Lord, we ask that your peace may reign in this world as you intended it. And Lord, we think of some of the troubles at home for the rioting that happened a little while back because of asylum seekers and the perception of unfairness. And Lord, we also think of our public services for our health service, for our education services. Lord, it's easy to say we need more money and more investment. Lord, help us to find a way to provide the public services that are required in a way that is effective, but also efficient. Lord, we've been thinking about church leadership this morning when we've looked at Titus and the advice he received from Paul. And Lord, we pray for those that you have called into leadership in our church life, both here nationally and internationally. Lord, we pray that they may see and know your word, your will for their lives, your will for the churches. And Lord, we lift before you now those people that are known to us, whose health gives us cause for concern. Lord, we pray for their restoration, for their healing. That whatever their illnesses, they may be restored to us. So that they can again be part of the fellowship. Which is so important to them and to us. And Lord, all these things we pray in Jesus' name. And we pull them together now in the words Jesus Christ taught his disciples and has left for us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So we come now to our closing prayer and blessing. May we persevere in faith, May we go out in hope and may we act and speak with love. By the grace of God, our creator, redeemer and comforter. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. To go now in peace, to love, serve and share the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining us this week and we hope to see you in person or online again next time, next Sunday. Bye for now.